Fear not, Scranton. This is Pastor Elliot Cook here at Jackson Street Baptist Church here to share with you and make simple God's truth for us today. Um, yesterday I mentioned that uh, uh, the divinity of Christ relates to the Trinity and said that maybe someday I could um, actually teach on the divinity, uh, on the uh, Trinity. And uh, today, I'd like to start that with you. Uh, you can't cover it in, in a 10-minute little devotional thought, but let's read from God's Word in Matthew chapter 3. Starting in verse 16, Jesus had been baptized by John in the Jordan River. And as soon as he was baptized, he went up out of the water, and at that moment, heaven was opened, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting on him. Him. And a voice from heaven said, This is my son whom I love. With him I am well pleased. Well, I start there when talking about the Trinity because what do you do with that? Yesterday we learned that Jesus is God, He is divine. So, what do you do with the fact that there's the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit? all in this one setting, in this one moment in time, in a physical form and in an audio form up from heaven, God himself speaking, the Holy Spirit is present in the form of a dove and the Son is present in the form of Jesus. What do you do with that? You know that the Holy Spirit is God. You know that the Father, God, is God. You know that Jesus is divine. What do you do with three persons and one being, believing that the Scripture is true when it teaches that there is only one God, not three gods, not three parts of God that when they come together, they are God together. No, there are three persons and one being, God, that each of them have all the fullness of God in them, even when they are apart from one another. What do you do with this passage when all three are present? There are, there are so many things that we can talk about, but uh, the divinity of Christ is, is one truth in Scripture. Um, the idea of a trinity in Scripture, uh, nowhere in the Bible does it talk about trinity, but it does talk about Father, Son, and Holy Spirit time and time again. You see, um, in the way back at the very beginning, the creation account in Genesis, right? Let us make um, man in our image. Well, who's God talking to? Is he inviting the angels to create with him? They don't have the power to create, number one. And we know that God himself, Jesus himself, are the only ones involved in creation. So even in in that um, creation account, planted are the seeds for the Trinity, the plurality in God himself. When he refers to himself, let us make man in our image. He's talking as a plurality and he's not talking to the angels because they had nothing to do with creation. Is he using a figurative language as he is, is doing this creative work in front of the angels and including them in this declaration. No, he's referring to himself and his nature. His nature is one that is far, far greater than our mind can comprehend, and we certainly cannot contain him and put God in a box in our heads and, and grasp him fully. He is so much greater and fuller and bigger than any of us could ever know. I mean, most people, even Jews who believe in one God, have no problem with a duality in, in God. You have God the Father and you have the Holy Spirit. In the Old Testament, that's accepted. It's almost taken for granted that there's a duality of God, that God is one and yet he exists in the form of the Holy Spirit and he exists as the Heavenly Father. In the New Testament, Jesus comes along and we've added to that uh, duality of God uh, the triune nature of God, the fact that he exists in three persons, uh, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Um, it, it's planted there in the Old Testament. Uh, just take a look at, at uh, Abraham and the three visitors. When he's at Sodom and Gomorrah, three visitors come to him, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The Father sticks around to barter with him, over uh, the souls there in Sodom and Gomorrah, and two are sent, 
the Son and the Spirit are sent into the city to, to rescue Lot. And they go down there and they're faithful and, and they rescue Lot and they bring him out. Um, but there's three there. It's important. It, it, it's highly symbolic of the Trinity represented there in the Old Testament. There are many places that I could take you, but uh, the triune nature of God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. How do you wrap your mind around that? You can't. And, you know, I have theology, theological treatises here on my, my shelf here in my office, and you can read it, and so much has been written about it, and it gets complicated and convoluted and hard to understand when man tries to explain it, but it's really that simple. God exists, and he exists however he wants, and it's not that he exists as the Son at one moment, and then he, he, he exists as the Father, and then he exists as the Spirit, and then he comes back, and he, no, he exists as all three, all at once. <laughs> if you can just open your mind up to believe that, you say, how can something be three things at the same time being one? H2O. It can exist as steam, it can exist as a solid in ice, and it can exist as a liquid, all at the same time. A book. Well, you have the cover, which has uh, the title on it, the Holy Bible. You can have the story written inside it, and you can have the concept of the story uh, as it's told and comprehended in one's heart and one's mind. Uh, it's all the Bible, you know, um, just different ways to comprehend it. Um, there are many illustrations. They all fall short. God is mighty, and he's bigger than your mind can wrap around because he's that expansive, and you cannot get your mind around God. The truth is he is what he is. He even declares himself, I am. It's just too hard for you to, to comprehend who I am. So why bother? Just call me I am. Don't put a name on me. Don't try to put me in your box, little human. <laughs> I'll blow your mind. And he does. Every day he blows my mind. And I pray he's blown yours. I pray that you have, have turned to him and asked for forgiveness of sins. God the Father Almighty became flesh in Jesus. He died on the cross for our sins. And we can live eternally if we but trust in the simple good news. Does it make sense? Sure it does. On an earthly level, we all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We owe a debt that we cannot pay. The Father paid that debt by dying on the cross for our sins. Therefore, we can now have forgiveness and eternal life. Get to live forever without Christ's death. It makes perfect sense. Perfect sense. And that's what the Bible teaches. It's a logical faith that we have. And yet we do not trust in logic. It's simple, a gospel truth. It's a message that's easy enough for a three-year-old to understand. And, and it complicates uh, people in, in, in seminaries and, and uh, the educated of this world cannot, cannot comprehend it. I don't understand that the truth of God can be that simple and that complex all at the same time. I cannot understand how he can be a one being and yet exist in three different persons. I cannot wrap my head around God and I can't put him into my box, but I know what he did for me and for you. He died for us that we can have salvation full and free, free and clear of our sins. If it's your desire, pray this prayer, won't you? Heavenly Father, I am in need of forgiveness, not just this one time, but for my whole life. I surrender. I have done things that have been wrong. I'm probably doing something that is sinful, and I probably will do sin tomorrow. Father, forgive me. Save me from myself. I, I turn my heart and life over to you. I, I, I am so sorry for my sin. I repent of it. And though I'm, I'm stuck in this human form and, and so easily get entangled in sin, free me from my sin. I do believe that Jesus died for me. Forgive me. 
my sins past, present, and future somehow, Father. It doesn't even make sense talking like this, but forgive me for, for the things that I'm going to do against you. God, help me. Help me to live for you, to be different from this day forward, to be your child. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Uh, you know, the simple gospel truth in practicality in our lives is very, very complex. The idea that you can ask for sins that you haven't even committed yet. Would, wouldn't you just go out and start sinning? You could. You could. But that is a very selfish way to embrace the Messiah, the Christ who died on the cross for your sins. The true believer, in turn, doesn't say, oh, I'm saved so I can do whatever I want and selfishly live for themselves. Instead, they understand that they have been bought and paid for with a price and that they are no longer their own, that they are Christ's, that they are God's, and they live for him and they want to please him instead of bring him heartache. And that's what we do when we sin. We, we cause uh, God and Christ himself great heartache. He died on the cross for every sin that I commit uh, and continue to commit. I am a sinner still, and I need God's mercy and grace every day as you do. Um, I just pray that each of you will try to surrender more and more to Christ. For when you do, he comes alive, alive in you and transforms you and makes you a, a better person. And you're not saved by becoming a better person. You're saved by your faith in Jesus who died for you. This is a miracle. This is a miracle. And it's all wrapped up and involved in this concept that man calls Trinity. And who invented it? I don't know. When it came about, I don't know. I know that Jesus is God. I know that the Holy Spirit is God. I know that the Father is God. It's how I make sense of it. I hope you can make sense of it. Even if you cannot describe it fully or understand it completely, it is God's truth. Trust it and believe it. You'll be better off for it. Hey, this is Pastor Elliot Cook signing off from Jackson Street Baptist Church, reminding you, Scranton, fear not, God is with us.